This is Tom. In everyday life, you won't even see him. But we know he's there. Tom is here to do what he does best. <coughs> he learns about you, even if you're just trying to relax. And he knows exactly how to take notes. Guys like Tom make every day challenging. But not on our watch. With Verif, Tom doesn't stand a chance. Hi everyone, I'm Janar. It's great to be part of the Estonia Digital Discussion. And I'm here to tell you about uh, fraudsters like Creepy Tom, as you just saw in the video. Um, so, let's get into it. There are more than 200 million businesses worldwide, but still about 5% of the digital economy happens online. The biggest barrier for entry for those businesses is limited trust. And limited trust slows down the digitalization of those businesses. Um, if we're looking forward into the problem, then identity theft and fraud has been marked in the top five risks globally in 2019 report. And businesses worldwide lose about $200 billion due to the identity theft. The problem has been fixed by charging honest people and businesses take 5% tax uh, that needs to be paid because of fraud. We at Verif witness online fraud attempts every day. And in order to help our customers and partners to understand and share the transparency, we put together a very fraud report about 2020. We looked back into the previous year, 12 months, and uh, shared what are the different te techniques and tricks that fraudsters use in order to trick the system. We looked at the three major industries that uh, we are working together with, which is fintech, mobility, and crypto. And definitely, uh, we took a look how COVID-19 pandemic has induced the fraud globally. If we're looking at the whole identity verification market and how has it changed, then pandemic has changed it a lot. Identity verification market has um, increased twice during the year, mainly driving by businesses that needed to adapt to the digitalization that went around. And due to that, we saw that many new industries actually uh, needed identity verification, needed to verify people. Among them, for example, governments, health, and even education, if uh, you want to take an exam and verify who's the person behind the screen. One of the growing phenomena in online identity verification is the rise of the deep fakes. What is a deep fake? It's synthesized media where the likeness of the person in the image or video has been replaced by somebody else. And this is one of the examples that I wanted to show you as well, is that um, fraudsters are getting smarter and technology advances, which means that it's becoming harder and harder for just the human eye to make the difference between what's real and what is fake. If we're looking into the, into the examples, what is the fraud that we actually see, then something to keep in mind is if we're looking at the three industries, which is uh, crypto, fintech, and mobility, the average fraud rate is approximately 5%. This means that 5% of all the verifications that we see are fraudulent. 
So let's look into the fintech and the reasons why the fraud trend actually changed during the year. So beginning of the year, as people started to move their banking online due to the pandemic, then the fraud more than tripled. But on the other hand, if we're looking to a different sector, which is the mobility, then um, at the end of the summer, when uh, people um, try to find a different means for transportation in order to be healthy and avoid risks, then they actually uh, started to use more scooters, uh, rental cars and mopeds. So, uh, but uh, if we're looking at very f with, uh, what are the different fraud types that we're seeing, then identity fraud is one of those types and the most common type. Uh, what is identity fraud? If I'm taking someone else's uh, government issued ID and trying uh, to pretend to be somebody else. So if we're looking at it in crypto and in mobility, then we're seeing comparing the first and second half of the year in crypto, 11% of increase in that type of fraud and in mobility, 16%. But let's go into a real practical example, what we at Verif are seeing as one of the examples that we catch. So we noticed abnormally busy traffic in one of the car retail shops. And additionally to the store employees who were being verified, uh, we saw that the customers uh, of that shop were asked to present their government issued ID and do a portrait photo. Something that we acknowledged and understood is that uh, the customers didn't actually uh, have a clue why they were doing this. So in the background, there was an account opened for them without their understanding. And we, because of that, we let our customer know what is going on. And we put an end to this fraud vector, which meant that the fraudsters couldn't actually get free money from those accounts. If we're looking from this car retail shop from the US and going to a global view, where are we seeing actually the most fraud? Then US is leading in global, which means that we're seeing 10% of all the verifications that are coming in are fraudulent. But if we're looking at it from the mobility or fintech standpoint, then we're seeing that in mobility, it's the Netherlands, which is leading and in fintech, it's Romania. Verif is building infrastructure for trust. We allow any website and mobile application to match the person with the government issued ID. Identity verification isn't just about comparing two pictures. It's analyzing multiple data inputs. So for us, it's looking at the behavioral information, it's analyzing the documents, device information, network information, biometrics, and multiple other parameters to understand that Janar is Janar in the online world. And we rely mainly on AI and automation. So we call on human intuition only when it's absolutely necessary uh, to understand if the verification is fraudulent or not. So it needs an intelligent fraud engine to beat fraud. And while doing that, we actually uh, support different documents from more than 190 different countries and more than 9,000 different documents. To summarize uh, this together, I'd like to remind everyone that more businesses are mov moving online and more people are moving online as well. This means that fraudsters are moving online. Due to that, Verif needs to be a couple of, head, couple of steps ahead of fraudsters in order to protect the businesses and the people. Thank you, I'm ready to take the questions now. If you'd like to know what are the different document types that are being used by fraudsters, then join me into the breakout room and we can discuss it even further. Uh, well, Jana, thank, uh, thank you so much for being with us in the studio and thanks for uh, giving us an overview over the uh, fraud report uh, 2020. Uh, we do have a couple of questions from the audience as well. Uh, but first of all, we want to take a look at uh, the results of the previous poll. Uh, which sector would benefit, uh, benefit the most from uh, secure uh, identity authentication methods? And the answers are as follows. Uh, it is a quite clear majority for government, uh, followed closely by banking, 
uh, with mobility and shopping being a tiny bit further behind. Uh, would you agree with that, or uh, where do you see the most use cases for, for digital identity? I think uh, digital identity is really sector agnostic. So it can be actually all of them, and that's what we're seeing as well at Verif, that uh, it doesn't <laughs> matter if it's mobility, banking, government, um, the identity is core for everything because in order to trust, you need to verify. Absolutely. Uh, in Estonia, we have an electronic identity that is not just used uh, by, by my doctor and by the tax authority, but also by uh, my favorite bookstore and my supermarket. So this is uh, absolutely very important, this agnostic approach. Uh, we do have several questions, as I said. Uh, the first one is, what is the guaranteed service level of ID verification that Verif can offer? Uh, automated versus manual, uh, in brackets, double verification. So if I understood it correctly, like uh, what is the percentage that we're doing it automatically versus what we're doing it manually? Uh, so for us, it's 95% <coughs> of all the checks that we're doing are already automated. But the question is, what is those 5% that we need the human intuition to be called in? So that where, that's where the understanding the different types of fraud actually comes into play, that uh, Fraudsters are really, mm, let's, um, let's call it innovative, and um, that's why it's a continuous fight against mm -hmm. fraud that we always need to keep innovating. It's not about building one blocker, but it's, uh, it's a layer after layer after layer, and that's why for the years to come, we need to analyze what are the different attempts that are coming in and always iterate based on this. Because for various cases as well, as we're working with different sectors, then we're seeing what are the different fraud types. So if we see that uh, fraud is coming in from one angle, we can actually uh, shield all of our partners uh, against that type of fraud. So it's uh, building up the moat of defense uh, mm. behind that. You mentioned different layers and filters. Can you give us a rough idea how many layers we're talking about? Well, that's definitely something <coughs> that uh, I can't share out loud, all the different layers. But uh, some of the examples that where we go into is, as I mentioned, using the device or the biometrics. Mm. So if I do verification on my own and even switch the device, switch the document, then we can link those verifications together just using the biometrics. And same for the mobile phone as well, that I can switch the person, switch the document, use the same mobile phone, and still Verif would know about it. And this is kind of cross-linking and understanding how different verifications come together. Super helpful for the car retail shop, as, as I brought out as well. Very good. Yeah, it's it's always nice to see real life cases where you where you can save people's lives, money, and and uh, lots of stress as well. Um, the second question is: How can we protect ourselves from deep fakes that pose as different people and commit fraud or try to commit fraud? I think yet again, it's uh, it's the layers. So in mm. our case, how we are managing to protect against deep fakes is uh, we have a video first approach. So each verification that we do actually comes in with the video recording. So if I think about it, then it's always how we look at it, the cost of fraud mm. aspect. How much does it cost for me as a fraudster to do the fraud versus what's the benefit that I'm getting out of it, actually? So our goal is to increase the cost of fraud so it doesn't make sense to do the fraud at all and thus blocking this. So uh, that's where the video first approach has been really, really useful for that. And this has helped us to protect against deepfakes as well as one of the examples.